Well, my friends, I'm a little tired today, but I do have a word to share, and I think it's an important one. So uh, hopefully you join me and take something from today, and you'll be encouraged, and it'll be a building. So today is going to be a topic on Christian family and the way it ought to be. And first thing I want to say biblically, if you are involved in any ministry, in service and doing something for others, but not everything is well in your family, you need to drop everything because everything you're doing is wasting your time. God's not pleased with it. And nobody needs your ministry when you can't take of your family. And I have scriptural support for this. I'm not just saying. So let's open up First Timothy and read it together and discuss what we read. So First Timothy, open it up with me so you can follow along. Make sure I'm not misreading or misquoting anything. Chapter 3. It is trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of an overseer, it is fine work he desires to do. An overseer is somebody who overlooks other people and makes sure, makes sure they're doing everything right. So an overseer, in a way, it's like a pastor of a shepherd, uh, a shepherd of sheep. You know, he overlooks and makes sure everybody's doing their thing correctly because he wants them to live a happy, fulfilling life, abundant life that Jesus offered and so somebody who wants to be in that position to be able to tell people how to act and what to do and help them spiritually these are the qualifications and then we're gonna go into you know what I said in the beginning an overseer then must be above reproach it means nobody can say anything about bad about him because he lives above all that the husband of one wife so you know not sleeping around and not seeing anybody on the side and I'm assuming not divorced and remarried, uh, but that's my assumption. Temperate, which means um, has a good attitude, you know, not easily angered. Prudent, or, um, well, I think you understand these words. Respectable, hospitable, means invites people over, always happy to see new faces at his house able to teach because how can you tell others how to live your life if you can't really teach them properly not addicted to wine or pugnacious but gentle peaceable free from the love of money he must be one who manages his own household well keeping his children under control with all dignity but if a man does not know how to manage his own household how will he take care of the church of God and here's where service comes in, what I talked about. And not a new convert, so that he will not become conceited and fall into the con condemnation incurred by the devil. Because new converts, you know, it, they can be much more easily taken off the right path. Because they don't have enough experience and um, with God to be able to discern truth from untruth. And he must have a good reputation with those outside the church. Right? So people who meet him every day and are more likely to get him angry so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil so they can't say anything bad about him either deacons likewise must be and here deacons um, the word used here is servants diakonos which means servants uh, this same word is used when uh, Martha comes to Jesus and said you know about Mary sitting at his feet and she says am I gonna be a diakonos myself or diaconella, which means like, am I going to be a deacon this myself? She's not going to help me, which means servant. Am I going to serve my, you know, by myself? And also Jesus says, he who wants to be the greatest among you, let him become a deacon, right? That's the same word he used, a servant. That's all it means. Uh, it's not an official office that you will find no proof of that in scripture, especially if you read it in original Greek. Uh, also, uh, maybe you remember when... Uh, Jesus' mom was telling the servants to, to make wine. She says, all right, deacons, go and do whatever he tells you to do. She also used the word diacon, uh, diaconos, which means deacons, which means servants, because they were the king's servants. Also, when Jesus is saying the parable of the king, when he says to his servants, go take this man, bind his feet, and throw them into the outer darkness where there will be gnashing of teeth. 
weeping and gnashing of teeth. There also he says, the king says to his deacons, go and throw this man, bind him and throw him into the outer darkness. So deacon means servant. That's all it means. And everybody who wants to lead any ministry in church, including uh, in church, I'm not meaning a building, but meaning interaction with other people, the church of Christ, you know, other born again believers. If you want to interact with them and help them do anything you want to do with them, and usually here servants are appointed for a specific ministry, such as managing money. In Acts 6, we read how uh, servants were appointed to make sure that the Greek widows and the Jewish widows get the same amount of food because there were complaints that, you know, there was uneven apportioning of food. And so uh, the apostles said, you know, we don't have time for this. Uh, we want to be dedicated to preaching the word. So we're going to appoint seven people to be servants here. Also, it says diaconeo, which means to be deaconess, uh, deacons and serving people, right? Same word. And all they did was make sure that everybody's getting the same amount of food. Simplest thing. But they had such high standards. They must have been full of the spirit, you know, above reproach and so on. And here we again read what it means to be a servant of God, right? High standard. And we just read as well, if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? If you don't have, if your wife, if your husband, if your kids can't testify well of you, there's a problem. You need to go drop all your ministries you're doing in the church and you need to get that straight. Because God's not pleased with anything until your inner life, the life with those closest with you is in the right standing. This is just Bible. This is just what it says. And... Seven, he must have, uh, sorry, eight, deacons, likewise, servants, likewise, must be men of dignity, not double-tongued, or addicted to much wine, or fond of sordid gain, or filthy wealth. Not double-tongued means they don't talk behind, you know, this one, and then they go back and tell somebody else a completely different thing, or like, in your face, they'll be like, oh, you're such a great person, and you turn around, and they're like, oh, this guy sucks, you know. So on, these are simple words. But holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, clear conscience, they walk. These men must be also tested. Then let them minister as servants, if they are beyond reproach. That's what it says in the original. Uh, women must also be dignified. Not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Servants must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households or their own families. Again, servants must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own families. That's what it says. For those who have served well as servants, as servants in, in, in services, obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long. But in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the family of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the, na the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So here he says, you know, I'm telling you this about Jesus Christ. That's what we're representing, the truth. And he says, in order to represent this truth, verse 15, which is the church of the living God, the family of God, for you to know how to act in this family, to represent and be the pillar and support of the truth, which is the church's call to be, take care of your own family, right? It's an encouragement for us. Now, you might ask yourself, you know, what does it look like to take care of your own family, for to have a good relationship with your children, with your wife, and so on? I would like to read Ephesians chapter 5. So you can skip there with me and we'll read it together. Ephesians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. We'll start there. 5, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, wine, for that is dissipation, or do not get drunk with wine in excess. Be filled with the Spirit, 
but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, excuse me, and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And be subject one to another in the fear of Christ. Wives, to your own husbands, as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body, and the body being as believers. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to, ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. I want you to notice that first it said in 21, be subject to one another. So, um, just like Christ submits to us and is subject to our desires, for, for example, when God wants us to do a certain thing and we resist and say we don't want to do it, He never forces Himself on us. He lets us go and make mistakes and disobey Him because He wants us to do that of a pure heart. In the same way, husbands should not rule over and not submit to their wives' desires, even if they're bad and false and might bring pain. They should not enforce it forcefully the way Jesus doesn't enforce things forcefully on us, but should subject themselves to the desires of the wife the same way that the wife um, that the, uh, Jesus submits to our desires. He doesn't approve of them, right? Sometimes you can tell your wife, you know, I don't approve of this, I'm against this. But she goes ahead and does it anyway. You have to submit to that and let her do it while making sure she knows that you're against it. But, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to control because that's not how the Holy Spirit works with us husbands. And we're supposed to love our wives as Christ loves the church. So we have a perfect relationship with God, we see how he's acting towards us, we should act towards our wives in the same way. And we're going to read that below, it says that. But as the church is subject to Christ, also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also the church, because we are members of his body. All right, so I'm going to read again. Um, and I want you to pay attention. Wives, listen to what's written to you, specifically. Husbands, listen to what's written to you, specifically. Don't think about each other right now. And I'm starting with husbands and wives because that's the foundation of the family. Then we're t we'll talk about kids and parents and other things. Wives, uh, okay, be full of the Holy Spirit, not being drunk with wine. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, to your own husbands, as to the Lord. Or it says submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So here, wives, in the original, in the Greek, it doesn't say be subject There's or submit. That word is gone. It just says wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. And a good argument, very good argument could be made that wives, it's not referring to submit, it's referring to be full of the Holy Spirit. So wives, be full of the Holy Spirit to your own husbands as to the Lord because that's where the sentence starts in verse... Um, 7, 18. He says, but be filled with the Spirit. And he talks, submitting to one another. Right? There's no, there's still no subject, new subject uh, introduced. And then it says, wives to your own husbands. So wives be full of the Holy Spirit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be there to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might, might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to also love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. All right, now children and parents. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. If you're a child, learn to obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. If you have grown up already, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, 
To honor means to value, show value, as to a treasure, right? Show value, or that you value your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise. This is for those who are grown up, married, moved out. You must still honor them. Show them that you value them by different methods. So that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and the sincerity of your heart as to Christ. Not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good goodwill render service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good thing each one does, that he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. And masters do the same things to them, and give them give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him, with God. Straightforward. One more thing. If you want to minister in the church, if you want to be a, a servant in the church of God, just to serve somewhere, I want to finish reading Timothy. I don't think we spent enough time on that, and then I'm going to wrap up. So this time, hopefully it's not going to be a half hour sermon so that you know I'm just gonna say everything I have and we'll finish there Sec first Timothy chapter 3 here we go okay I'm not seeing Actually, we did spend enough time on this. Um, but all, you know, where it lists what, where it was listing. Deacons or servants must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of filthy wealth, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested then let them minister as servants, if they are beyond reproach. They must be husbands of one of only one wife, good managers of their children, and their own family. And we just read about what that looks like in a family. So God bless you guys. Take care of your family first. You know, a Christian family is one where you come in and you feel the presence of God. You feel love between each other. You feel that there's understanding, there's value. You know, we have differences. We have different personalities. We have um, misunderstandings. We have different views on things. But above all these should be love. Your theology should never be higher than your love. Your dissension and doctrine should never be higher than your love. You know what the church is built on? Only two things. The confession that Jesus is the Christ, Messiah, Savior, and the Son of God. That's it. When Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus said, upon this stone I will build my church. Upon this confession. Jesus is the Christ, Messiah, Savior, and he is the son of God. Upon these, the church will be built. That's it. So if you have this common base, that means you have the same master in heaven. And if you have the same master in heaven, your family ought to function in love. The fullness of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness. You know, all these great things written in Galatians. So God bless you. May you be filled. May you be encouraged. And have a blessed day rest of your day, evening, whatever it is, and life. Live this out. And once your household, once your family is in the right place, then think about serving others with your family involved because you'll be above reproach. Nobody can say a bad thing about you from your own family and they're going to support you. They're going to say, you know, we're having a great time here. We love you being part of our family. And we encourage you to go and, you know, spread this love to others and let's do it together and you'll be a small home church and when you have a small home church and this is all in the right place you can expand 
the kingdom of God because you have the kingdom of God in your house. But if you don't have the kingdom of God in your house, you have problems in the house, you have problems in the family. Until these are resolved as far as it is possible from your side, especially if the, the people there are Christians, then don't even think about going somewhere and building God's kingdom because that's the first step. And again, I said, as far as possible from your side, because Jesus did bring a sword. And people who live after the flesh, after sin, follow the master of this world, they will disagree with you. They will hate you. And for this reason, you know, do everything possible from your side. And because they're disobe disobeying God or something else, if they're rejecting you, you know, you can come to God with a clear conscience and say, Lord, I really want this resolved. I'm doing everything I can, and if there's anything else I can do, show me. And, and then you can serve God with a clear conscience as well. So God bless you, and bye-bye.